Hi. Good afternoon. Sat Sri Akal. Vanakkam. Namaskar. And welcome back again to the TOG webinar. On a normal day, the doctors would have come to the TOG studio. But today, their house and hospital is their studio. I welcome our esteemed speakers, Dr. Nandita Palchetkar and Dr. Atul Ganatra. Hi. Hi. You all know they are the liveliest doctors of our country. Now, I request Dr. Nandita Palchetkar. Madam, she is the president of Amox. She is the president of of Foxy 2019 and we all know her as an infer infertility consultant. She is well known. She has an epitome of beauty, grace and intellect. So I request Dr. Nandita Palchetkar to please begin with her presentation on a serious note on recommendations in pregnancy for COVID. Thank you. Thank you, Niranjan. Thank you so much uh, for that wonderful introduction. And today, friends, uh, you know, you've heard a lot about uh, discussion on COVID and pregnancy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I just found this tweet by Fain Yunus, an MD from America, and he actually says it's good news for COVID mothers with the COVID because expecting moms are really, really worried. So what it says is 43 patients actually show that mothers were not more uh, susceptible to COVID than uh, the normal population. Also, all the infants were absolutely okay. And one third actually of the mothers who had COVID positive were asymptomatic. So I think that's really great. Uh, the maternal fetal outcomes with COVID far better as compared to SARS, H1N1, Zika, etc. So I think that's really good news. And let's begin on a positive note, this particular CME. Uh, on um, pregnancy with COVID. You know, I have given a lot of talks on pregnancy with COVID. So this time I thought I will do it a little differently. I think we need to understand that every for every one patient, we need one to two, uh, two to 2.5 people are infected by one index case. And if you see this beautiful chart, infectivity versus lethality for the disease, you can actually see that coronavirus is somewhere in between. If 100 get infected, as I told you before, about 2 to 2.5 would get infected in coronavirus. And look at the others, the bird flu, the MERS, the SARS, the smallpox, the infectivity is much, much higher. And how many people uh, would, uh, you know, uh, uh, would die from. And if you can see again, the novel coronavirus, the death rate is much lower as compared to bird flu, MERS, SARS, etc. So if you look at the other side, the death rate flu versus COVID-19, COVID-19 definitely has a higher death rate as compared to the common flu age-wise, if you see in all age groups completely. And what everybody has been asking is that how long does it stay? And this is a March, 20, 20, March 20th, 2020 study which says that the uh, virus is detectable up to three hours in aerosol, four hours on copper, up to 24 hours on cardboard, and up to two to three days on plastic and stainless steel. So when people are trying to be careful about getting things inside the house or about, uh, you know, by uh, taking care of people around who are symptomatic, I think these are the things that we should keep in mind. Every time I'm asked this question, are pregnant women at high risk from COVID-19? It's a very limited data which says no evidence that they are at high risk. And as I told you at the beginning, the positive reinforcement which, we, which we're getting from the world over that these women are not infected at a higher uh, you know, um, uh, chance of getting infected. But of course, in pregnancy, there are changes in immunity and these can be badly affected by respiratory infections. Mm -hmm. Postcrenal not being shared. Well, sorry, one minute. Let me just share the screen. Can you share the screen now? Can you see the screen now? 
Yes, yes. Yes, yes. This I otherwise I won't be able to see. You make it smaller, no? If you want, or I don't know. Yeah, is this okay? Hello? Yes, yes, ma'am. We can see yes, it. The screen can be seen. Okay, all yeah. right. So, uh, so pregnant women definitely because of their lower immuno uh, immunity is suppressed. They could be, but most of the studies show they're equally. Uh, there's no evidence that they are, they are at a higher risk. And the questions that I always get is. I am pregnant. I can, how can I protect myself? I think this time I prefer doing a question answer thing because it answers a lot of questions which people have. And if anybody has questions, I think Shimon, you can help me with it because my screen doesn't show anybody else's pictures and you can let me know if, what is the question they want to ask. So the question that I'm asked is I'm pregnant. How can I protect myself? I think we can take these simple methods that wash your hands frequently 20 seconds with soap and water and you know the best thing is uh, that you should actually time yourself because when i realized that uh, when i was washing my hands it was not really 20 seconds 20 seconds is a long time when you're washing your hands so be careful face hygiene is very very important avoid touching your eyes nose and mouth and Put a space, social distancing is very, very important. Put a space of one meter between yourself and the others and cough or sneeze into your bent elbow or into a tissue and get rid of it properly. I think those are very important. And I think what we really have to realize is this is going to be a way of life now. Corona is not going to just the lockdown period. You don't have to do this. But till we get a vaccine, say a year or so, we will have to take these precautions in that everyday day-to-day -day life but remember uh, if you're pregnant and you have fever cough or difficulty in breathing seek medical care early call before going because you know you can follow the directions of your local health authority because each authority has a different protocol and in our country it's notifiable so i think you should call them and tell them that you're coming Pregnant women and women who have dis, dis recently delivered, including those affected by COVID-19, should attend their routine care appointments also. I think this is very important. The telemedicine role if a patient is pregnant. Because if the patient is pregnant and uh, she wants to stay away, from uh, you know being infected or in general, I think telemedicine is the way to go about. So you can have your antenatal checkups over the telemedicine. And uh, usually the physician needs only three checkups. But I feel that what I have been doing with my patients is the sonographies at week 12, the sonography at week 18, and the sonography at 32 weeks. These are the times when the woman should go out. And the rest of the time, we can actually monitor from home by doing a video call, seeing her edema if she has any, checking her blood pressure and her uh, you know, pulse on the telemonitor itself. Because nowadays, we have all these uh, instruments. And also, the instruments to monitor uh, contractions are available so that can be used. So telemedicine would really be of help. Secondly, the eternal question, should pregnant women be tested for COVID? In each country, in each city, it's different. Depending on how many tests you have, like in Bombay, now we have private uh, laboratories testing. So wherever I'm delivering patients, I test the husband. Uh, a couple of uh, hospitals have made it that the husband and the wife would be tested because they are the only people during the delivery. So I think it's really important. But however, WHO recommendation is if a pregnant woman is symptomatic, that becomes a priority to be tested. Now, can COVID-19 be passed from a woman to her unborn or newborn baby? This is a very relevant question. You know, if this question, especially because uh, 
uh, we don't know the effects in the first and the second trimester. Earlier on, when I was reading, and that time it said that, okay, nothing happens to the baby. But now, the latest 7th April, 8th April, 9th April uh, directives which have come have said that the evidence is not enough. We don't know because the disease has happened only in December. And we need nine months to actually figure out how it affects her in the first and second trimester. But the recent studies that have all been of patients who have delivered and, uh, you know, the studies have checked, I think 83 women's study is there where they have actually checked the amniotic fluid, the placentas in some cases, the umbilical cord, the baby's nasopharyngeal swabs, etc. And uh, the it has shown that the mother, uh, I mean, it cannot be transmitted in utero. So I think that would be a good thing. The question that a COVID positive patient asks is, can I have a normal delivery? I think uh, the, there was an expert consensus meeting which was held in Ma on March 25th, where nearly 34 discipline, multidisciplinary clinicians came. Sorry, it was 20th Feb. And they said, Right now, there is no clear evidence because they have uh, delivered patients, but most of the deliveries have been by cesarean so far. And uh, what WHO recommends is that only those that are medically justified, you know, obstetric indications are there, and those are the ones that should have Caesar, not because she's COVID positive. I think the mode of the birth should be individualized in patients. The timing of delivery is also very important. The timing of delivery also should be individualized. If the woman has mild or stable cases, then you don't need. You just have to do close surveillance of the mother and the baby. That's all. And you can deliver her full term. But in critical cases, you should not bother whether the baby is premature or not. If she mother is critical, you must deliver immediately. And sometimes if she's critical in the early pregnancy, termination also can be considered uh, as an option uh, in order to save that woman's life. And of course, careful consultation with the patient, her family, and an ethical board is advised. This is the April 2020 directive. Can a woman with COVID-19 breastfeed? This is a question which is very, very important because we know that close contact and early exclusive breastfeeding helps a baby to thrive. And especially in our country where we have, uh, you know, um, the socioeconomic status is low. The breastfeeding milk is the best sustenance to the child. And therefore, a woman with COVID-19 should be supported to breastfeed safely hold her newborn skin to skin, share a room with a baby. But what should you do so that you can do all these things? Practice respiratory hygiene, wear a mask, wash hands before and after touching the baby, and routinely clean and disinfect surfaces around the mother. I think that is very, very important when you allow the women to do breastfeeding. And there are times when women cannot breastfeed because they're too ill. Then what can they do? They can express milk or donor human milk. And I think expression of the milk, also the same precautions, as I said before in the previous slide, should be followed by the woman. What is the duration of SARS-CoV-2 virus shedding in bodily fluids of symptomatic patients after remission of the symptoms? Uh, you know, oral fecal route does not appear to be the driver of transmission. This is the European uh, Center for Disease uh, Control and Prevention, which has given this comment. But it's significant. Uh, it says that oral fecal route, we have to see how it goes. Right now, it is not a driver of transmission. So, but what happens is discharge patients should be advised to strictly follow personal hygiene in order to protect household contacts. And this applies to all convalescing patients, especially you have to be very careful with children. What is the discharge criteria for confirmed COVID-19 cases? Again, this is the ED ECDC, that's the European Center for Disease uh, Prevention and Control. And they say at least two upper respiratory tract samples are negative at 24 hours interval. And when you have a symptomatic patient, after the resolution of symptoms, samples should be collected at least seven days after the onset or after three days of without fever. 
For asymptomatic uh, infected person, the test to document virus clearance should be taken at a minimum of 14 days after the initial positive test. Italy indicates that serology tests to document IgG antibodies specific to the SARS virus, COVID-19 virus will also be of value. And if you see this chart, this is a beautiful prediction where initially the antigen obviously is uh, positive. And then the green line is the IgM antibody. And that becomes detectable after about five to seven days with the onset of the disease. And then it disappears at 21 days. And the IgG antibody starts getting positive at 14. And if you see the chart below, is really very beautifully said that patient, if shows only PCR positive, patient may be in the window period. If PCR and IgM positive, it will be the early stage of infection. If all three are positive, that's the active phase of infection. And if only PCR positive and IgG positive patient may be in late or recurrent, recurrent stage of infection is also possible. Only IgM positive patient may be in early stage of infection and PCR actually may be false negative. And only IgM, that means patient has had past infection and has recovered. So all these uh, the uh, these uh, rapid bedside tests, once they come, we need to be able to interpret them properly when we are uh, doing these tests for patients. Now, can asymptomatic patient be contagious? I think the virus has been detected in asymptomatic patients, and Zhu et al. has reported that the viral load of asymptomatic patients is equivalent to that of symptomatic patients. And that's why uh, even though they have few or no symptoms at all, they are infectious. The viral RNA is in the oropharynx at least for five days. The management has really uh, been mainly respiratory, respiratory management, but a lot of antiviral treatments have come in. And uh, what is recommended, what is being used now is lopinavir, uh, Ritonavir has been the preferred drug regimen and is known to be relatively safe in pregnancy. The recommended dose is two capsules of lopinavir and ritonavir orally together with the nebulized alpha inter interferon inhalation twice a day. Now, this is a beautiful chart of treatment principles. You know, um, if you can see uh, the hydroxychloroquine and the azithromycin, this study which recommended the Paris study actually has shown not much of a difference, but hydroxychloroquine with azithromycin and you can see the, re uh, the recovery is much faster within five days. And if you see the right hand side of my slide, it's the lines of attack. Uh, you know, the first is the fusion with the mucosal cell, and then there's translation, proteolysis, there's a translation and the RNA replication, and then packaging. So these are the different ways in which you can hit the target. If you hit it at the first, before the fusion, it is the plasma of the convalescent patient which can be used. The second is the ACE2 receptors where endocytosis, that is where the chloroquine and the hydroxy uh, chloroquine will act. And then the proteolysis is where the, uh, you know, the, the lopinavir uh, will act. And then after that is the replication of the DNA where the new drug will act and studies are being done about it. That is known as remdesivir. So this is which inhibits the viral replication through the premature termination of RNA transcription. And that is uh, being studied now. It's the WHO is doing uh, studies on it. And today morning I heard uh, Dr. Soumya Ramanathan from the WHO talking and she said this is the drug which is now being used for uh, the treatment of uh, corona, novel coronavirus 19. So hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, these are the studies which are under current, uh, uh, undergoing right now HERO, HCQ, and PATCH. Once those studies, uh, you know, 
uh, we know the trials, the results are supposed to be out by December. We will really know uh, what is the use and whether it can be used for profile access, though the government of India has used it. Let me talk about plasma therapy and then we'll go about the profile access with hydroxychloroquine. The plasma therapy for COVID-19, there's a, you know, there's not much evidence, but yes, we can use the plasma therapy. As I showed you in the previous, it will be at the beginning. So it will prevent the virus from getting into the antibodies, will totally attack the virus as soon as it attaches itself to the mucosa of the throat. So yes, convalescent patients, but right now we don't have enough data to say that when exactly the patient will have the maximum number of IgG antibodies which can be taken in. And you know, transferring that, uh, doing the plasma therapy is not um, uh, harmful because the way the plasma is treated actually kills the live viruses. So it would be really be helpful in a lot of patients. But of course, besides the drugs, this is just used to reduce the severity of the disease. Then the COVID-19 vaccines. There are 83 vaccines right now being made. And five of them have now in some sort of a you know record because within 62 days itself it has entered phase one which is never known for a vaccine so i think it's fantastic the way the world is actually uh, coming together and working on it it's really amazing and i am hoping that the vaccine will come sooner or later and uh, they are predicting that by the end of this year we should have something which we can use until then we have to use, uh, use all the precautions and take it now the icmr and the government of uh, india have given instructions for uh, HCQ to be used by those who are in the front line. Uh, but today when I heard Dr. Soumya Ram, uh, Ramnathan, I'm not very convinced about it, but there are a lot of studies which are coming out. So I think at the moment we're going to follow uh, government instruction. Then I just want to say a word of caution that those who don't really require it should not take it. And it is definitely a drug of choice when you are infected, but whether it works for prophylaxis or not is not really known. So this is all uh, the government of India's directive. Uh, these are beautiful, uh, uh, you know, infographics, which you can actually put them in your clinic. This is about the virus and how it attaches, et cetera, et cetera. And the second one is about uh, how the virus spread can be prevented. And I think once we get back to work, once this lockdown is over, all of us will need these charts to be put up so that, uh, you know, we can um, uh, inform our patients, educate our patients. And that's why I put these two infographics in. And I would like to conclude my talk by saying just three ANC visits, which will include sonographies. As I said before, the 12 weeks, the 18 weeks, and the 32 weeks. And uh, that, of course, the NT scan, the anomaly scan, and the color Doppler can be done at that time. Use of telemedicine. In fact, here I would like to say, you know, when I was a medical student in JJ, we were, we were taught with the tape how to measure. And uh, Dr. Devdas, in fact, uh, used to uh, always tell me his method. And I think that is something we can do it on the tele, uh, on the telemedicine. The patient can measure it with the tape measure and we can know that the growth is going satisfactory. And I would just like to say in these days, we have to be kind. Being kind is, I think, the primary thing that we all doctors should imbibe in us. Be empathetic be patient. I think uh, that's very, very important. And some things that I want to say is follow government guidelines. I think it's very, very important. Our government is fantastic. It's taking a lot of precautions. And your municipality, uh, health workers, the police, everybody is taking so much risk in trying to protect us. So I think we should follow their guidelines. Behave, if, even if you're not infected, behave as an infected pro person. Protect those around you with all the things that I told you. And be aware of myths. The Indian strain is not weaker. There is nothing that shows that Indian strain is weaker. Chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, as a preventive, it's a no-no because we are not sure of it yet. Past malaria or BCG vaccination protects you from COVID-19? No, definitely that is a myth.
Summer temperatures will end the pandemic. I don't think this is true and people really don't know. So you should not be in a false sense of security. Don't wait for a drug or a vaccine. Break the transmission. And that is my thing. Break that curve. Crush that curve. That is what is important. Lockdowns are difficult. And please help those less fortunate. Because there are lots of people who are daily wagers, who don't have food, who don't have shelter. I think it's our duty to really go out and help them. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot. I think it was really wonderful talking to you, though I could not take questions because um, I just could not, uh, you know, get the screens on. So now you're going to have to help me. Sheshan, can you help me how to get off the screen uh, sharing? You to close the slide share. Yeah, it's done. It's done. Thank you. So it was a wonderful uh, experience and thank you, Dr. Nandita. Uh, Dr. Nandita to be with us. And really you have given a good insight with the latest reviews of literature and the latest details uh, about uh, usage of uh, plasma antibodies, which is the latest uh, study. And your TOG is garnering a lot of response. So uh, thank you so much. We will come back to you. Now I invite our next speaker, Dr. Atul Ganatra. Dr. Atul Ganatra is the present vice president of Foxy and he is also the treasurer of, of IAG and member of managing committee of MOGS. I request him to share his uh, screen with his slides and uh, over to you, Dr. Atul. Thank you so much for joining us. Is my screen visible? Yes, uh, please uh, go on the slideshow. Thank you. So thank you, Ch uh, Dr. Komal Chauhan, the chairperson for the medical disorders. Uh, Dr. Niranjan Chauhan, the host, Science Integra for facilitating this and you know teaching us how to do Zoom lectures and conferences. And uh, Nandita, wonderful seeing you again. Thank uh, you. I'd like to start by saying Man proposes, God disposes. I think no matter what you think, uh, we never know what we have in mind. God, it is all written there. As I, who knew three months ago that this is what we were heading towards? And you know, if we knew, we wish we would have taken some precautions. Uh, anyway, so we will just go on to the next slide, pregnancy and COVID infection and update. What I'm going to restrict myself is to the guidelines that we have published for Foxy, along with Dr. Alpesh Gandhi and Dr. Parichit Tank. Uh, Nandita has discussed most of them. So I'm just going to rush through some of these slides because there is going to be a lot of repetition. And uh, we will talk a little more on the healthcare provider and the labor room strategies and the PPE. I'm trying to move my slide one minute. Yeah, so this is the guideline of pregnancy that we have come across. And the we, Foxy has participated in the neonatal guideline as well. So for those who would want to go through these guidelines, they are all there on the Foxy website. You can go through them. We will be coming out with another version as in the next week because a lot of changes have taken place since then. So the in, in to introduce once again, this is an unprecedented global wall and mankind is facing the same enemy, the coronavirus. And if this is for the first time, doctors are in the front in, in the war field instead of soldiers and doctors are behaving like soldiers. And this coronavirus, the SARS-CoV-2 is a new strain of corona causing COVID-19 first identified in the Wuhan city. And it is characteristic, especially those from person-to-person -person transmission, which was documented as late as 2019 of December. However, I think India woke up much later in February and March. This is what the update from the Ministry of External Affairs, the MHA, that is the Health Ministry and the ICMR yesterday. 6,800 cases, 716 new cases, tests done, 1,60,000. Population, general population positivity was around 0.3%. In those with severe acute respiratory infection, 1.8%. And that is why they argue that yet there is no community transmission. COVID tests being done by in all 213 labs, of which 66 are private. 
numbers would have been much, much higher if the lockdown had not been there. Government facilitating air cargo and interstate movement of foods and grains and essential grocery. Most routine patients, non-COVID patients being managed by telemedicine and all essential services are going on as per routine. Also, the ICMR uh, spokesperson, Dr. Ganga Khedkar said that the IgG IgM kits are at the end of the road. We will soon have them by the next week. And once that happens, these tests are going to be probably as less as three, 400. And we will be doing these tests for all patients like we do HIV, HBS, AJ and others. So the measures for the pregnant women, disinfection of surfaces to reduce fomite spread. For women outside the house, it is preferable to work from home. Keep a distance of at least one meter. Avoid non-essential travel. Use a private vehicle. Avoid gatherings. Avoid your god bharai. Minimum visitors to meet the mother and the newborn after delivery. Avoid what is called as TOCC. That is travel, or occupational travel, crowd and cluster. Pregnant women should stay at home as much as possible unless there is an absolute medical urgency. Routine antenatal visits be referred. Nandita spoke about it. Limit them to three or four. And official uh, permission has been granted from the Medical Council of India for telemedicine and you know, telephonic uh, consultation and advice. Keep visitors to its minimum. Wash your hands as frequently as possible for about 20 seconds, which is definitely a lot longer than we normally do. Cover your mouth and nose with a bent elbow or a handkerchief while coughing or sneezing. And now, of course, in Maharashtra, and most places, I think wearing a mask is compulsory. Avoid touching your face, eyes, and mouth. Keep a safe distance of one meter as far as possible from the next person. So the antenatal visits, dating scan with blood report can be combined with blood reports if necessary. NT scan with double marker, anomaly scan at 18.3 weeks along with post-glucose blood sugar and a tetanus TD vaccine can be given. Subsequent visits can be deferred. Patients can measure their weight and blood pressure at home. A 34-week scan if necessary along with a Tdap. Telephone consultation, check your weight and blood pressure at home. Most people have this facility. Watch for fetal movements after 23 weeks and inform the doctor SOS. And this is probably one time where most healthcare providers will accept telephonic consultation, which is otherwise not permissible. For the healthcare worker, I think three very, very important principles. Of course, they have to follow distancing, which is not possible at all times. Use of appropriate PPEs, and this is what we are going to be talking about correctly, and use chemo profile access, especially for those who are in the front line and working with active COVID patients. As far as the general population is concerned, the healthcare worker should also consider social distancing. Maintain a one meter distance. Remove non-essential items from the consulting room. Facilitate cleaning and disinfection and reduce the risk of fomites. Clean your consultation table and the examination table with 1% hypochlorite solution as frequently as you can. Wash your hands with soap and water and urine and alcohol sanitizer, base sanitizer after every examination. Patients should be offered surgical masks, but now it is compulsory, not only if they have respiratory infection. Wearing a mask is compulsory for all patients and healthcare workers. There are three levels of protection. This is what I want to talk about here. Level one protection is a cap, mask, a working uniform. So as soon as you go to the clinic or hospital, change into OT clothes or a gown, disposable latex gloves for non-isolation clothing. And this is in a non-COVID hospital in a place where there is little chance of having a patient with a sari. Level two protection, cap, mask, which is supposed to be an N95 mask, disposable medical protective uniform, disposable latex gloves and goggles. So the goggles and the disposable, this is more, is especially fever outpatient, non-respiratory symptom examination, imaging examination, suspected confirmed patients, cleaning of surgical instruments used with suspected confirmed patients. Level three is a proper PPE, uh, personal protective equipment. I'll show you a picture on one when we did a surgery yesterday. This is how the PPE is to be worn. I think this is the most important part. And if you follow the arrow, first scrub your hands, put on a disposable surgical cap, followed by a mask, the first pair of glove, 
Then you dock your sterile PPE, wear the second pair of glove, and that is when you are ready to perform a surgery or conduct a delivery. And the same holds good for removal. So remove the inner glove first, and then subsequently remove your cap, mask, your PPE, and go on to the last protocol. This is how our OT was getting ready in the triage for an abruption that we did yesterday. The one in white is the anesthetist, which is fully, he's wearing his PP and above that he's wearing a gown because he's about to give a regional anesthesia. And see the headgear, that is the most important, which covers the entire face, so no lycor or blood or vomitus of the patient can spill onto you. When do you test our patients? Do we test all patients? I don't think that is absolutely uh, possible, though ideal, yes, if the IgG, IgM tests come in, it will happen. But as of now, I don't think we have te enough tests to do all patients. However, some corporates have made that as a rule. A pregnant woman who has an acute respiratory illness with one of the following criteria, history of travel abroad for four, in the last 14 days, after 6th of March, a close contact, She's a health worker or hospitalized with features of acute respiratory illness. And a pregnant woman who is presently asymptomatic should be tested between 5 and 14 days after coming into direct and high-risk contact of an individual who has been tested positive for infection. So I think this is something that we need to you know, put up in our hospital clinic so the, and tell them that these are the guidelines from the government and proxy so that one does not face any objection. So the notification, of course, we are in the process of making our own registry. We've suggested that the government of India and proxies uh, pro forma has been accepted and soon we will come up on the FEX proxy website and the second version, the registry as to how do we inform and our patient, our uh, proxy and the government about the number of cases that you've come across. Criteria for quarantine, a person living in the same household as a COVID-19 case, a person having a direct physical contact with his or her infectious secretions without recommended PPE, a person who's in close environment or had face-to-face -face contact with the COVID-19 at a distance, which is within one meter like an air travel. Instructions for a home quarantine, stay in a well-ventilated single room, preferably alone with a separate toilet. Another family members ideally should not stay in the same room if not possible, at least a one meter distance. Needless to say, one needs to stay away from elderly people, pregnant women, children, persons with comorbidities within the household. And I think for all healthcare providers, it is absolutely necessary that as soon as you come home, all our wives are at home and what they will insist is do not touch anything. They will open the door for once for you. Go straight to the bathroom, wash your hands, change your clothes, get into a fresh pair of clothes, no matter how often you leave the house for medical reasons. Restrict his or her movement under no circumstance, any social religious gathering, like a wedding, a god barai, or a condolence should be attended to. Effects on the fetus, as of now, as of the 28th of March, when we came across, women do not appear to be severely unwell other than healthy adults. The percentage, like we said, like we said in the lowest population is about 0.3%, unless the woman has a symptoms of respiratory disease, but special care needs to be taken in patients who are diabetics, elderly, and pregnant, obesity, respiratory distress, asthma with pregnancy, or advanced age. And I think these should be uh, seen separately and one must apply more vigil. The triage, I think our OPD also, if possible, has to be divided into three parts. Do not encourage a new patient unless you've taken the history on the telephone. You need to ask them their history, their close contact. If anybody in their family traveled abroad, came into contact with a person, do they have any cough, cold, or fever? Infected, of course, we will have to do the test. Potentially infected with symptoms of sari. Contact with infected individual, travel abroad, healthcare worker, until the tests results have come. And of course, the clean patients will be seen much easier, even your reception people will have to have hand sanitizers, gowns if possible, and a cap and a mask. MTP and contraception care services are essential services like doctors and they must continue as far as possible. We must see that if the patient falls in the 63 days category, then we advise them medical methods. 
with minimum blood tests required. And of course, adequate counseling of contraception should be done with all patients. And this is something that must not be allowed to, uh, we must not allow this to be delayed because we know in the second trimester th things can get a little difficult. Now, when do we admit our patients? Hospitalization, as of 25th of March, all confirmed cases are being hospitalized in India for isolation and observation to watch for the progress. We do not know if this is going to be possible. If there is a community spread, we do not have that much place. Look, last part of my slide, of course, patients who have any respiratory symptoms, respirate of more than 30, saturation has to be monitored more vigilantly in all these patients or as patients with any lung lesions in, on imaging, of course, the shield will have to be applied and Q so far, respiratory rate, mental status, systolic blood pressure needs to be monitored and a score of two of more than two is suggestive of sepsis. Medical management, this is what has come from the DMR in Mumbai, hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, and the swine flu medicine, that is Tamiflu, which is uh, more accepted, that is oseltamivir, 75 milligrams, BD for five days, azithromycin, 500 milligrams, OD for five days, and hydroxychloroquine. I think this is what is easily available. There are other antiviral drugs, but their availability is an issue, and this is what has come from DMR, DMR in Mumbai as late as the 30th of March. Vaccination, I think Nandita has spoken at length. It is a lot of vaccines are being tried, but yet we are not lucky enough to have one. Labor room protocol, extremely important. The woman should call us in advance when she goes into labor. This is, we are talking about patients with infection. Of course, most likely she would have been in hospital for the first 14 days in isolation or quarantine. She should use a private transport. She should be met appropriately by donned PPE at the reception. Reception and triage in the same room as to be used for admission, labor, and delivery. And if possible, a separate labor room and a separate OT must be there for patients with, with proven COVID-19 positive infection. And there should be a restriction on number of attendance to the patient and even the medical healthcare provider, number of people going in and out should be to its minimum. And of course, the person monitoring the labor will keep going in and out. And if possible, there should be an area where the person sits when the labor is being monitored. Labor room protocol, labor goes on as per protocol, counsel and, your, and train your staff. Do a drill with your staff in the labor room and in the OT. Minimum staff in the labor room and OT. All attending delivery should wear PPEs. Avoid difficult delivery and prolonged labor. Anesthesia as per routine. All new units will be tested immediately at birth and again after 48 hours in patients with proven infection. The sample, of course, is from the nasopharyngeal area. Cleaning and out of the OT and labor room. I think this is very, very important that all OT equipment should be soaked in 1% hypochlorite solution for about 30 minutes to one hour and then washed and then autoclaved. And we can either use hypochlorite if it is available or bleach. I think hypochlorite solution is not very expensive and we can prepare it. Or you could even use diluted liquid chlorine, uh, chlor uh, chlorine that is 1000 mg per liter as strength. Floors, walls, object surfaces should be wiped two to three times a day. Air can be sterilized by fumigation, plasma sterilizers, or UV lamps. And after the procedure, biological fluids, blood, fecal matter should be treated with the above solution before disposal because there is some risk of eco-oral transmission. If there is a large fluid spill, sodium hypochlorite powder should be spread all over the area and left in contact for 30 minutes before swabbing and cleaning it. Reusable medical equipment, linen, fabric, clothes should also be treated with sodium hypochlorite solution before they are processed further. So basically 200 ml in 20 liters of uh, water in a bucket, soak them for about half an hour and then do the necessary changes. Postnatal care, I think, goes on as per routine. The woman, of course, will be in quarantine till she's negative. We can repeat a swab between five and 14 days. And once she's proved negative, then the rest of the things continue. The discharge card from the unit should have advice about COVID-19 infection. And of course, we must be careful about what care we will give her. And of course, tell her that if you have any res acute respiratory illness, she will report to us immediately. Watch out for sari and home quarantine, and this is which is to be instructed very clearly. Consent, 
all patients in the OPD and indoor patients, we must take a consent. In fact, we prepared two consents as a sample as to what consent should be given. Name of the hospital during the lockdown in the wake of the government, I have come to the hospital myself as an emergency treatment. If I have a symptomatic carrier, asymptomatic carrier, undiagnosed patient, which may endanger the doctor and the hospital staff, it is my responsibility to take appropriate precaution. I also know that I may get the infection in the hospital or from the doctor and will take all precautions to prevent this. And I will not hold the doctor accountable for an accidental infection. And finally, friends, our first job is to see that we do not do any harm. So premium, non, no share. I think this is the most important thing that we need to remember. Thank you, Atul. Uh, requesting you to please stop sharing the screen. It was a wonderful presentation made by you, Alpesh Gandhi, sir, and uh, Parikshit Tang as both co-editors. And I'm I'm aware that there were 20 other contributors, and it has gone viral, and it has been uh, in the pipeline to be expect accepted by the government of India. You have done a wonderful job. A lot of uh, you know the queries have been answered by you, and Dr. Nandita. We after your lecture, we had uh, 1,500 members uh, which were logged in, and after Atul's, right now we are in uh, uh, in the same range, about 1,550, and I'm very happy that so many viewers are online. So thank you so much, both of you, and now I would also like to thank our. Cast and uh, webinar. I think you're not able to hear you. Himalayas, uh, that's what. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we missed that uh, image of Himalaya, and we would like to show those. I request Ramon to please show that image of Himalayas, the beauty of Himalayas. You can see this oh, wow. picture and. You can see it's from Jalandhar, and basically when we are seeing from 30 kilometers, it is so clear, the pollution is now less, we have less issues with the pollution. And on this note, I would like to share the benefit of the audience and viewers that we are having a serious talk of COVID. And I would like to share a recent study from clinical infections diseases, which was published on the 2nd April 2020, and it says, SARS-CoV-2 is not detectable in the vaginal fluid of women with severe COVID-19 infection. It says further and concludes that the clinical characteristics of the 10 women which were studied were similar to those reported with severe COVID-19 patients. All 10 patients were tested for SARS-CoV-2 in vaginal fluid and all, all the samples tested negative for the virus. So at least some relief is there for us. Now I request the Speakers, you know, was, you know there I, was one question sorry, by the audience that ivory ivernectin, you know, whether it can be used, it's an anti parasitic drug. So, there is actually, a, I when I was preparing for this lecture, Niranjan, there was actually one study which was published on April 3rd, which actually says in vitro it has shown to be antiviral. So that may be a drug which is easily available since it's antiparasitic and it has a lot of antiviral properties. So that may come into it. So that's the whole thing, you know, even though the lectures are happening every day, there are so many changes. All the things that, uh, you know, uh, I projected on my uh, thing were April 7th and April 8th. So we need to be updated constantly. And I'm, that's yes. what we're doing in 40. Atul just mentioned that we will have to update these guidelines in the next week that's uh, required. So that is the question which I've answered. And yes. I think Atul, there's another question. Thank How will we much. deliver a woman in our uh, nursing home? I just saw that on the chat. Yes, there are questions which are there. And I would like to ask, uh, it's from Dr. Ritu Santwani. She's from Pune. She's our Foxy M. And she has asked, dear Nandita ma'am, want to know how to proceed in those patients in whom already ovulation induction has started in both IUI and IVF. Should we cancel these cycles or embryo freezing? She's Dr. Ritu Santwani. Dr. Nandita ma'am. 
Hi, Ritu. Uh, good to have you back with us. And Ritu, what the guidelines for the infertile patients are, since we really don't know the effect of uh, COVID-19 on pregnancy, it's better to freeze the embryos if you're doing IVF. Go ahead, do the pickup and freeze the embryos. And if you're doing IUI, I think it would be avoidable to do IUI because uh, we've been told that all the recommendations that have come is that uh, do not do the, try and get the patient pregnant, just delay the pregnancy if you can, except in cancer patients where you need to preserve their fertility if they're going in for chemo or radiotherapy or surgery. Or now the SRM is also debating about low reserve patients, whether to allow them to undergo ovum pickups. But now normal patients, you can just avoid getting them pregnant. Okay, thank you, madam. Now we have about 1800 viewers online. Thank you, both of you being there. I would like to ask the next question to Dr. Atul. Atul, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah, there is one question which has been asked from Bilaspur, Dr. Saurabh Birthare. He has asked that once you get infected by COVID viral infection, does we do the patient get a long-term immunity? Is there any immunity to them? Uh, I think we are still very, very early days. I do not, uh, I don't think there is enough evidence because uh, we do not know if anything like this is going to happen. Of course, as we have upcoming studies, we'll know more about it. The disease is only about four months old. So I'm not sure. But uh, if you see other viral infections like dengue, and they say that every time you get dengue, the disease is more severe. And I hope that's not the story with the COVID-19 infection. But I don't think we have the answer for it. Yeah, it's too early to say something about right now. And uh, studies are still going on. There is one more question, Dr. Atul. I know you have to leave for the other uh, presentation. So we will take this last question with you. Is that okay with you? Fine? Yes, yes. Are I there any direct effects minutes. due to the yeah, virus? The yeah. Okay. Okay, fine, fine. Thank you. Thank you to be there. Uh, Atul, uh, are there any teratogenic effects which we see because of the drugs which are used or the viruses? This is from Dr. Yadav. Uh, well, HCQ is known to be safe in pregnancy because we know a lot of our SLE patients take HCQ right from prior to pregnancy to the end of pregnancy. Only thing is when they give HCQ for a longer period of time, they advice to do ophthal checkup and uh, those who are allergic to chloroquine should take it with caution. I think that is the only thing uh, that care needs to be taken. And uh, we are, as far as the drug is concerned, there are no teratogenic effects. Whether the virus has any effect on pregnancy, again, I'm sorry, it is still very, very early. As of now, they have stated all the studies that have been done in China and the UK, they have not found any obvious teratogenic effect. Yeah, we have a special guest, and I'm surprised to hear from Father Anthony. Father Anthony is from Sacred Heart School of Kalyan. Hi, Father Anthony. How are you? I'm not a father. I, my name is Anthony. I'm a father. Oh, we are live right, right now. We want to know from uh, you or Sacred uh, Heart School, uh, the benevolent gesture which you are doing for doctors. wonderful gesture of distributing this face shields to various hospitals. I received when I joined uh, Cyan Hospital on 1st of April. There is a video I would like to share 
and uh, yeah, i hope so i would like to say thank you to all hospitals like pioneer and kingdom and all because it's my personal experience my son who is 24 today uh, 24 years old now so something from the age of one and for 12 years some of the finest doctors in the india treated him and it nothing happened but somebody told me why don't you go to kingdom hospital in the garment hospital for you and with a 10 rupees uh, appointment uh, charge i think the government i went there and sangeeta rawat that is what said for 12 years i did not but in one hour i got a solution to my son she he was his dysplasia was diagnosed he underwent a surgery and, and he's fine gentleman today so it happened in a at the hospital in a general or government hospital and i'm grateful to all of you i'm grateful thank to you thank you uh, thank you anthony the whole idea uh, of you getting us on this show we have eminent speakers and uh, dr nandita palchetkar is with us dr atul ganatra who has made guidelines the whole idea was that uh, yeah. you have been very kind enough to give this face shield mask to all the doctors who are on the front line and it can be easily made by 3d printing technology and by laser machines which are available everywhere all over india and anthony has made a software basically which is free and it can be downloaded and people can just use that in this laser machines and factories and can be used so we would like to show your youtube video thank you so full gesture shrimon can i have the video to be seen by the audience and we have 1800 thank members thank you online thank you so much yes
thank uh, Albin to give us this face mask. The idea was to show the whole world that how uh, you know common people and other people are uh, helping the doctors. We have questions. There are more than 200 questions now. We will take one by one. Uh, Dr. Pratap Kumar has uh, been uh, nice enough to share a question to here. Dr. Atul, how many times a pregnant woman should be asked to come with minimal number of checkups? Dr. Atul, sir. I think we said that about maybe three or four visits in a low risk population. I think a dating scan, a 12 week scan, an anomaly scan, and then subsequently one more scan whenever necessary. Okay. So the dating, uh, the dating scan will be combined with blood tests. The anomaly scan, we can give a TD. And then the subsequent scan, uh, checkup, whenever she comes between 30 and 34 weeks, we can give a Tdap vaccine along with that. Uh, thank you. Dr. Nandita, there's a question of uh, to you. Dr. Varsha Lahade, she is asking, I want to ask question as, are there any intracellular remnants of COVID or in the liver like malaria? Uh, so far that we know that this virus does not cause viremia. So it does not reach the other organs. The only way it reaches the lungs is because of the direct inhalation and the gastrointestinal tract because of the oropharyngeal, uh, you know, uh, connection which is there. So, but only one percent of the patients develop viremia. So this is something that we have to look for. Those are the patients who would who could go into multiple organ failure, etc., because of the virus reaching there. But so far, the studies have shown only one percent. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Kaushik Das is asking in a small setup of nursing homes, Nandita, this is for you. There are limited resources which are there and the guidelines are being there for treating pregnant women and indoor admissions, including delivery. How can you manage this in a small setup? Can we manage this in a small setup? Okay, you know, Niranjan, there's a lot of confusion in our country. First of all, if you have a patient who is positive, she needs to go to COVID hospital. You cannot deliver her in your nursing home or in your setup. So this is an important message which should be given to everybody. Please, if you have COVID positive woman, send her. And as Atul has mentioned, our Foxy GCPRs uh, are very good. You know, it says that if there is a symptomatic patient who has fever, cough, cold, arthralgia, headache, or even diarrhea, <clears throat> these are the patients who would be who should be referred to covid get her tested for covid positive and don't attempt to deliver in a smaller nursing home <coughs> oh. okay yeah, absolutely fine uh, i think it's uh, pertinent to note that we are giving hydroxychloroquine uh, prophylaxis also to the healthcare workers there is one uh, question from dr vijay shri Atul, uh, can can you unmute your mic, please? Yes, tell me. Yeah, is it fine that we can ask you a question? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So you mentioned about hydroxychloroquine prophylaxis for antenatal mothers who are COVID negative but suspected contacts. Breastfeeding in such patients, would you recommend them? Are you talking about antenatal or postnatal? Uh, well, uh, this is uh, there are two things uh, part of it. One is antenatal mothers should we give them hydroxychloroquine prophylaxis who are COVID negative but are suspected contacts. And the second part is, can they do breastfeeding later on? Yes, breastfeeding. Uh, there are two schools of thoughts, the ACOG and the RCOG. But WHO clearly states that breastfeeding can be done with the usual hygiene that we follow. The mother, if she's COVID positive, will wear a mask, uh, sanitize, I mean, wash her hands, uh, wear a mask while breastfeeding and use alcohol-based sanitizers. Because of course, if she was COVID positive, the baby will be tested at least twice in a span of 14 to 28 days. So breastfeeding is permissible unless the patient has severe form of SARI where she needs oxygenation and other support and she's or she's on a ventilator otherwise. Otherwise, breastfeeding is permissible. In fact, we will be having Dr. Ram Chahar from WHO in the panel, which is at four o'clock, and we'll hear from the horse's mouth what WHO, and we have the ICMR head also. So we'll soon know more about it from them. Thank you so much. Uh, Nandita, uh, it's, uh, it's for you. How much duration should we cancel the infertility treatment? I know we don't know when the lockdown will come out, but I'm sure we will all be relieved very soon, hopefully. But seeing the scenario in Mumbai and Maharashtra, she has asked you uh, this question, Dr. Akansha Gupta. From? 
See, each okay. uh, state is different. I think Orissa has already announced uh, lockdown till 30th of April. So I think till we are un- in lockdown, we should not take any treatment. And there's a beautiful article from Italy, you know, which is there, uh, IVF in the days of uh, COVID virus. And the precautions that they say to take in the clinics is like massive, it's humongous. So unless you're prepared to do all that, I think you need to hold your guns, wait. And uh, Niranjan, again and again, I'm saying this, this is going to be a way of life. You know, COVID is not going to go away with the lockdown. Okay, we are going to have to protect ourselves. Those who are fit will have to go back to work and they will have to protect themselves. Use all the necessary hand hygiene, face hygiene, etc. etc. Isolation. It's going to be a way of life and uh, IVF, you can st- uh, start it after the lockdown. That is what we are planning to do. But again with all the precautions. Absolutely. Uh, I think our way of life is going to change. I just met residents today in the OPD and I told most of us are going to wear this mask for the next six months and seven months and God knows how much time. And uh, Dr. Rishikesh Pai had also joined a few days back. He said it might go for a one year and this whole economic meltdown may go for two years. So anyway, the situation, because I saw yesterday Wuhan, after 76 days, they had a lockdown been lifted. People have gone to the markets and people have gone onto the roads but they are still with those masks and there are still certain restrictions by the administration which is there. So thank you so much uh, Dr. Nandita. We have 1800 members still locked down with us and uh, they are still oh, yeah, the lockdown. Not allowing yes, they are also locked down with us and uh, seeing Atul and you both of you. Thank you so much. Uh, there is one more question from Dr. Fatima Shiva. Uh, it is uh, facilities without ICU can proceed with delivery of COVID positive patients when they are mild or without any symptoms. This is for Atul. Uh, if, yeah. Uh, extremely difficult question. Uh, if you are sure that she has only mild symptoms like a cough, cold, fever, uh, you may be able to deliver the patient, but uh, you will have to take a consent from them that if the condition does not improve, or if she develops severe form of sari, she will be shifted to uh, a better setup. Because once you deliver the patient in your hospital, your hospital will be under quarantine and the entire labor room and the uh, OT will be under quarantine for a couple of days. So I don't think one needs to take that risk at the moment at least, because unless you have a dedicated room, labor room uh, and a dedicated OT for a COVID patient, I think it is better she develops in delivers in a setup where these facilities are available. And of course, physician help, intensivist help if necessary. Atul, can I ask you a question? I thought you were not allowed to deliver COVID patients in any other facility except those designated by the government. Yeah, currently that is the status, but I do not know if God forbid if there is a community spread, where will all our patients go? I don't because at the rate. They are, the hospitals are being shut down. We need to find what some place where patients will deliver. Yeah. What Maharashtra is talking is each district, they will make a COVID positive uh, labor room and delivery. They're really working very hard on this issue now, that to have the delivery rooms and the labor rooms ready for these patients. God willing, if that happens, that will be brilliant. Yeah. Uh, Nandita, madam, there is one question for you. This is related to infertility. That's why we are asking. Dr. Preeti has said, when we... Go ahead and do an ovum pickup. Is there a transfer of COVID-19 to those eggs? And it will be already a patient with coronavirus. I mean, such situation may come in future. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was just reading yesterday some articles because uh, the experience is minimal. But what was the good sign was the eggs, the embryos and the sperms do not have those receptors which are there, which are required for the COVID virus. So that's a good thing. So they don't infect. And also, as I said before, the viremia is only 1%. So it doesn't reach the ovaries or the testes. And we have to look forward because there were a few papers which said that it can cause male infertility, like how mumps causes orchitis. But uh, nothing has been proven and they say that that is not correct. So we have to wait for more uh, papers to come. But at the moment, what I have read is that the eggs, the sperms and the embryos don't have that receptor which is required for the COVID virus to attach itself 
and enter the cell. It's a good news. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Nandita, to uh, give justice to this question and uh, answer it so nicely. Uh, Dr. Atul, uh, this is a question from Dr. Pragya Mishra from Patna, our Foxian from Patna. A very interesting question. She is saying that uh, when we have been told to supplement the nutrition in pregnancy uh, with supplements, you know, with like calcium, iron, and uh, all other selenium, zinc, and others. But then at the same time, the hotspot areas, there are no vegetables available. There are no fruits available. People can't access it. Access it. This is a situation which has even gone in Mumbai. And uh, K Ward, and especially in Dharavi area, they have all stopped the groceries and fruits, <laughs> vegetables, to be sold by the hawkers. So, how do we get these supplements? Well, I mentioned as my first slide that the government has assured that essential services will continue, and they are doing their best to do home deliveries of essential nutrients. And almost every area and society is going to get telephone numbers of nearby groceries where these things will be provided. And I think um, one will will have to help each one of us, like you know, make homemade paneer from milk or stuff like that, so that you continue your high protein diet. I think homemade rem remedies have to be taken care mm -hmm. of. I think milk, dal, paneer, cheese, sprouts, eggs. I think these are some high protein supplements which we'll have to give our patients. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> there's one question, Doctor Priyanka. Has asked uh, Atul, you can answer this. There are many asymptomatic patients, and they might be carriers. And if uh, you or we admit them for elective cesarean, do we also use PPE like for a suspect or a positive COVID patients? If the test has not been done in the safety of your staff and other patients, I think it is mandatory that all of us use PPE just like we were doing when we were doing HIV or HBSAG positive. I think we must wear proper PPE3 if you are not testing your patients. It is absolutely mandatory for your safety, for your staff's safety, and for the hospital's safety. So I think sure, Dr. Shobha Lande had also the same question. I mean, uh, the same question. So you have answered her also. Uh, uh, Dr. Nandita, uh, there is one question from Dr. Ruksar. Effects of hydrochlorine, chloroquine, sorry, on fetus in first trimester. Nothing. No effect. No, it, is, it is safe. It is a category C drug and it can be taken because all our SLE patients take it from one month prior to pregnancy up to term. And it is not shown to have any side effects at all. Okay. There is one I more question from uh, Dr. Nandita. Sorry. I'm sorry. Please, Nandita. No, no. That's fine. Okay. Uh, Nandita, there is a question. Can we use HIV kits as PPE during operations? Actually, that's not the one that you should use. This PPE hazmat uh, suits which are there, they are completely different and this virus is completely different. So it is not that protective. But if nothing is available, it's a better option. Check, I mean, your, option. check your HIV kit, pour water <laughs> on it and see. If it soaks your inner clothing, it is not the right method. You can use your simple wind cheaters and simple raincoats with adequate headgear and the glasses which are there in the HIV kit if you do not have PPE. Okay. Uh, Dr. Sharma has asked, patient is a career of COVID-19 in labor. What precautions and management of newborn should be taken? Atul, uh, or Nadita, madam. Go ahead, Atul. Like we said, there is extensive uh, care that has to be taken. I think the first care will be the healthcare provider, the obstetrician, the staff, the, neo the neonatal staff, the pediatrician. They will all be docked with proper PPE. And this child will have to be taken to a separate room for washing the staff who's Bathing the child will have to uh, be in a separate area, not the common area where the other children are being bathed. And of course, within 20 to 48 hours, the child has to be tested. And two tests have to be done within a span of 14 days. And of course, like I said, breastfeeding is allowed. Unless the woman is unwell medically and needs parental nutrition, needs 
IV antibiotics or has uh, on lung or CT scan a pneumonia and she has an obvious infection and she's on the ventilator. Okay. Uh, uh, Nandita, this is for you. Any investigations we do before any elective LSCS for a suspected case of COVID-19? I mean, do we have to do any specific investigations? See, uh, there are lots of investigations which have been said, but the specific one is, of course, the art, uh, uh, reverse transcriptase PCR which is done, which is the test, but that takes about 24 hours for the report. So right now in Bombay, in all our patients, the private patients, we are doing the test for the women. And if they're negative, then they are being taken. But the, as the Atul has said, they should be two tests, which are, you know, 24 hours apart. And you could be in the <clears throat> infective period so that test can be false uh, negative. 30% of the tests are false negative. So I think we need to uh, tune our minds to uh, taking precautions, using at least the basic precautions. They have level one, level two, level three precautions, which Atul has elaborated on. And those are the precautions that we must take when we are treating a woman, but try and do the test if possible. And now with the rapid testing, it'll, be, it'll add to it at least the information. And lymphocytopenia is known to occur, you know, all the viral markers, even uh, CRP is supposed to be raised in some cases. So all those tests are there. Uh, Nila, Nila, I'm sorry, I will have to I will have to Thank you very much. Komal, Niranjan, the entire team of you, uh, Science Integra. Thank you, Nandita. Bye. Thanks, Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Nandita, thank there's one so more question for you. Thank you, Atul. Uh, if we have a patient with triplet gestation, now what to do about the fetal reduction? When will uh, we I think that is an emergency. Allow it in COVID period, lockdown. I think that is an emergency and you should get it done. It's an emergency, okay. Uh, Dr. Komal, you can ask a few questions. Uh, you're also I'm... online. Yeah. I've got a question. If an infertile woman is conceived one month, she's just conceived through IVF and she's a doctor. So should she work? I think that is a question for you. Yeah, that's a very good question. Actually, that was the question that was asked by a lot of people that should I go to work? So the Foxy advisory actually says that stay at home. But if you are in an essential service, you can go to work with precautions. And uh, I know I'm repeating this again and again, but we have to get used to it. So even if you're pregnant, you have to use all the five things that we said for a woman, you know, face hygiene, hand hygiene, uh, respiratory hygiene, and social distancing. And that's how you should go to work. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Komal. There's one more question. Do we need to screen patients for COVID once lockdown over before starting any infertility treatment? So now will it be a routine like an HIV or a COVID? What is your take on that? You want me to answer it? Yes, Nandita, yes, you are the only one. Abdul has gone. I think, uh, you know, wherever it's possible and wherever it's easily feasible, I would do the test in every patient before putting them on the table. Okay. Uh, so we, uh, we might have to do a screening like testing for all the patients who come. Yeah, certain extent yeah you know yeah like our like our hiv Definitely. or we do H hcv so we do even covid test in all the patients probably okay. now we'll have to now what because do we do the for mtp services varsha lade joining from nasik he said hi to you Varsha, hi. I think MTP services are very essential services and it is part of the SR, uh, SH uh, services which we have to give everybody. So MTP services should be made available to all patients and COVID patients should be referred to COVID hospitals. Okay. So there's one more question. Uh, Dr. Ashi Shah has asked, should the patient from quarantine zone, that is red zone, be treated as COVID positive or a suspected patient in small setup? Hello, if the patient is quarantined, it's better to do the tests, no? So the test will tell you. 
yeah and then accordingly we have to shift him whether to in isolation or uh, you have to monitor the symptoms according to the to do a to do a normal uh madam what is the uh, role of steroid shot in an infected pregnant covid patient this is by dr jyoti dan saluja yeah you know there's a uh, in fact uh, there is one uh, thought process which says use steroids in uh, the covid infections to treat the infection because it reduces the severity so steroids are being used to reduce the severity so i think steroids to be given to a covid patient for lung maturity i think it should be okay yeah okay i think uh, it's uh, really going good and there are many still questions but due to lack of, time, lack of time we are i'm saying lack of time madam i request dr <laughs> komal to uh, give vote of thanks and uh, thank you for uh, coming on this uh, wonderful uh, webinar uh, and uh, we, it's been a saturday weekend i'm sure everyone we are busy in our houses but uh, we are still optimistic we are not angry we are not depressed we are not having anxiety and we are doing our best and so many doctors have joined us together and obviously uh, it's all uh, because of seniors like you who have come online and given the guidance for covid i'm sure they would be also interested to hear from you on a topic of infertility we surely will take down that also but uh, we are all waiting for 14th april i hope our sir I comes know. on i hope so i i hope it doesn't it it doesn't uh, increase more and uh, thank you so much from my behalf i uh, ask dr komal to please come online thank you yeah thank you very much and uh, it is a great pleasure to give vote of thanks first and foremost i would like to thank dr nandita palshetkar immediate class president foxy and a very very leading and a most prominent personality among our gynecologists who has spoken on covid on so many forums solved so many doubts and difficulties of all practicing gynecologist so thank you very much for sparing your valuable time and connecting with us and giving all and sharing all the recommendations what we should follow because covid has now emerged as a new medical disorder in pregnancy we have not read it in our textbooks when we are taught and now we all are relearning something and every obstetrician and gynec is now confused what we should do and what we should not do i would also like to thank dr atul ganatra vice president foxy who has actually made the guidelines the gcpr guidelines with foxy with dr alpesh gandhi and dr parikshit tang and i it would not be uh, proper if i don't thank the foxy alpesh gandhi the president foxy dr jaydeep tang the secretary general foxy who have permitted us to continue with this webinar series also i would like to thank science integra our team behind the scenes who have at the tog platform who have got all these webinars to your home as like a foxy tv daily giving us the updates and sharing knowledge on this platform thank you very much science integra team and also our sponsors sun group of uh, all sun inca sinora and spectra pharma for supporting us for giving us the educational support thank you very much stay safe be at home and keep learning thank you